I'd like to now introduce Carolyn Cohen, PhD Application Scientist at Fluxion Biosciences. I'll turn the presentation over to Carolyn and we'll get started with the webinar. Okay, hello. Thanks very much for attending our webinar today. I'm excited to introduce you to the BioFlux system and tell you about some of the applications it can be used for. Let's get started with the agenda. Today we're going to start with the background of Fluxion Biosciences, who we are, followed by a discussion of some of the parameters that are important for live cell assays. We'll then explain the BioFlux system and how it works, and finally, we'll look at some of the unique applications of the system for live cell assays and what the system configuration looks like. Fluxion is a small company based in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Our main focus is to design instruments and consumables to enable functional assays with live cells. Currently, we offer products in two spaces. One, for many types of live cell assays using microscopy, which is the BioFlux. That's what we're going to talk about today. And two, for screening ion channel response to compounds called IonFlux, which we would be happy to answer questions about or provide more information by request. Our first system, the BioFlux 200, was launched in early 2008 and has been adopted by labs worldwide for both academic research and for R&D in the pharmaceutical industry. What BioFlux offers and what we're going to talk about is an added dimension or added dimensions of control over several critical parameters that influence biology and that are not controlled for in traditional static live cell assays. Some of the controllable variables that we're going to talk about are shear, the importance of which we'll discuss in the following slides, maintenance of consistent conditions, for example, for compound delivery or environmental conditions like temperature and atmosphere, as well as the ability to perform these in parallel and to collect dynamic data and time lapse, especially important for the assays we're going to talk about today. All of these parameters add depth to your live cell assays. The very first parameter we're going to talk about is shear. Shear is a mechanical force, in this case exacted by fluid flow. In a healthy individual, the shear can range from less than one dyne to 20 dynes per centimeter squared. And in the case of stenosed arteries or other disease states or injuries, the shear can be well in excess of 20 to hundreds of dynes per centimeter squared. This ever-present force has a large influence on biological processes, causing changes in gene expression leading both to good changes, like we see during embryonic development, and pathological changes which lead to blood clot formation and inflammation. So it makes sense that shear should be a controlled parameter in many experiments including those in cardiovascular research, stem cell biology, microbiology, and inflammation. Current approaches to study these areas, such as the use of microtide plate cell adhesion assays and Boyden chambers, do not provide controlled shear. Here is a good example of where shear plays an important role in vivo. The biology of the endothelium is always under blood flow. When endothelial cells grow under shear flow, there are changes in cell signaling leading to morphological and functional changes in cell behavior. In some cases, as I said before, the response to shear can be beneficial, such as resistance to injury, and in some cases, shear can contribute to arthrosclerosis and thrombus formation. Besides shear stress, using flow for biological assays confers a number of other additional benefits such as full management of the microenvironment that the cells see, which is important to ensure consistent cell behavior time after time. As well, this provides the opportunity to change conditions reliably. For example, to create areas of continuous increased chemoattractance to enable chemotaxis assays, to provide pulsatile flow to understand the role of cyclic waveforms on cell biology, 
as well as continuous nutrient perfusion to aid in the growth of biofilms. How does Bioflux do this? Well, it was designed with multi-parametric control in mind. Using the hardware, which we'll talk about shortly, and the microfluidic Bioflux plates, we can tightly control parameters of shear from 0 to 200 dynes per centimeter square, uh, parameters of temperature, so ambient to physiological, use of external gases from, for example, 5% CO2 used to buffer media to anoxic conditions for hypoxia models. Our unique fluid control interface allows the channels to be compartmentalized so that assays can be run under two conditions at once. In addition to controllable environmental parameters, the Bioflux was designed to be easy to use, out of the box. The consumables are in a well plate format. As such, many assays can be run in parallel, up to 96 assays per controller. Because we use a microfluidic format, which by nature uses smaller amounts of reagents, that opens up the possibility of using precious reagents and rare cells to their full potential. At the heart of the Bioflux hardware is the pneumatic controller, which you can see on the upper left side. This affords very tight control of fluid handling and then the controller is coupled to the well plate using an airtight interface, which you can see I'm pointing to at the moment. Then the data can be collected using microscopy, either manual or automated. And then here on the lower right, you can see a software panel. So user-friendly software enables both seamless data collection with concurrent flow protocols and automated data analysis. Well, our devices are well plate fluidics. So what are well plate microfluidics? Well, I have a movie clip which while it's loading, I will give you a little preview. In this video, you will see our devices which consist of an SPS well plate which is the chassis for the microflu microfluidic channels. The plate will then turn over and underneath the channels, you'll underneath you'll see the channels. They run from well to well in independent units and the channels are repeated in an array over the entire footprint of the well plate. At the bottom of each plate is a cover slip and that's placed there for optimized imaging. So now most of you have the movie loaded and I will begin the playback. So here you can see the well plate and now it's going to slowly turn over and you can see the microfluidic channels here. This is a set of two of the channels. One is yellow and one is not filled in. Now you can see the array of channels over the whole plate. And so that gives you an idea of what the device is itself. So I have one more video here. And it's an explanation of how a typical experiment would work inside the Bioflux plate. And what it will show is how you place coatings and cells into the wells of the plate, and then we place the interface on top, and that makes an airtight seal. Pressure is then applied from the Bioflux controller, and then whatever is in the well, be it fluids or cells, are pushed into the channel. And then cells of interest can be cultured there, or later you can add cells from circulating um, sorry, circulating blood cells, et cetera. So this just gives you a little overview of a typical workflow. So I'll begin the playback now. So here you can see a pipette dispensing fluid into the channel, into the well, I'm sorry. And now you can see cells also being placed into the well. They're now flowing into the channel. And then you can see the waste is pooling up in the other well. And in this case, these cells are now attaching, and cells of interest, such as circulating cells, can be added. Those are the green ones, and they flow in, and then you can do your assay. Okay. Each channel is, for all intents and purposes, a single flow cell. But unlike a normal flow cell, which you can see a setup here on the upper left, there is no baggage associated with it. So for each experiment, you would need all of these apparatus. 
the bioflux plate serves as its own self-contained array of flow cells with one controller and a very small amount of media consumed. So instead of 24 separate flow cell setups, you can just use the one well plate. Here are some of the features that make the bioflux plate itself conducive to live cell assays. Of course, it's in a well plate format, which makes it very easy to handle in the lab. You can pipette into it, use uh, pipetting robots if you like. The cover slip bottom is optimized for uh, microscopy. And then three, the channels are produced extremely accurately, so they're identical to each other, which gives you insurance for experimental repeatability. And then the design itself favors simplicity. There's no liquids in tubes, and experiments are really self-contained within the plate. OK, let's talk about the Bioflux well plate microfluidic devices. They come in two main formats, 24 and 48 well, with slightly different uses for each. The 24 well design, which is shown here, this is actually half the plate shown on the upper right, um, is engineered really for experimental flexibility. There are eight channels in total, and each channel has two inlets and one outlet. This enables you to do compound switching on the fly. You can run this, the channels in parallel to compartmentalize them. And the design is intended for use for physiological shear. Then in contrast, the 48 wall plates come in two shear ranges which enable both physiological shear or lower flow rates. And the second one runs in pathological shear or higher flow rates. Each channel in this case is formed by two wells, one inlet and one outlet well. And what this enables is higher throughput per plate, so more data points. And you can see the channel design here on the right-hand side. And then you can see how it's arrayed over the plate on the bottom left-hand side. OK, let's talk about Bioflux applications. They really run the gamut from everything from what occurs in the cardiovascular space to the world of microbiology. Today, we've selected a few of our representative assays to talk about. So I'm going to talk about platelet adhesion today, immune cell adhesion, chemotactic migration and invasion, and also a little bit about angiogenesis, and then biofilms. Please let us know in the chat box if you have any questions about assays we're not going to specifically talk about here, or any assays that you'd be interested in learning more about in the future. So just please let us know. The first application we're going to talk about today is the study of platelets under flow. This is actually one of the best examples where the biology is directly affected by shear. It makes sense because everything is occurring under shear. In fact, the receptor ligand interactions that govern the platelet adhesion cascade as well as platelet aggregation are determined by shear and are actually different at different shears. So this cartoon that's shown is a really good one to understand this. At low physiological shear that starts on the left-hand side, platelets are really governed by what happens in hemostasis. As you go up higher and higher to pathological shear on the far right, the interactions are extremely abnormal. This is greater than 10,000 inverse seconds. And when, uh, von Willebrand is the main ligand, which in normal situations is just perfectly fine in hemostasis. So this is a good example for us to start with. Some of the assays that have been validated in the bioflux system for platelets are platelet adhesion to purified substrates, such as von Willebrand factor, uh, culture of endothelial cells for platelet adhesion, studies of platelet adhesion kinetics, and that includes aggregation and adhesion, and interactions between platelets and other cell types. So let's see. There are many instruments that are used in the laboratory to study platelet behavior. Some of them are more towards the clinical side. Some of them are more towards R&D. But they all have things in common where you want to use uh, movement of liquid, and you're using blood, whole blood or platelets. And you can see some of them here. One is light transmission agrometry, 
cone and plate uh, reactor, PFA, that's much more of a clinical instrument, and then parallel plate flow chamber, which is the most similar to the bioflux, meaning you're flowing and you're, you're looking with microscopy. The bioflux occupies a unique niche here. It has higher throughput and experimental flexibility and can fit into many types of experiments in the drug discovery pipeline, which is missing from the slide, but um, we can provide that in our, our, uh, our report afterwards. Some of the most important qualities that the bioflux has for these assays that differentiate it from the other technologies are the ability to close in on the in vivo models using laminar flow and pulsatile flow uh, with flexibility of substrate because the plates don't have a coating already, uh, the use of human cells and very, very small blood volumes, like tens to thousands of times smaller than in a parallel plate flow chamber. Okay. So here on the right, what you see are typical snapshots of platelet adhesion assays under flow on commonly used substrates. The top panel shows platelet adhesion on von Willebrand factor under physiological conditions, which in this case, the platelets do not aggregate. They'll actually form a rolling single layer of particles, and you can actually see the individual platelets in this micrograph. In contrast, on both fibronectin and collagen, which are shown on the lower two panels, platelets can adhere to the substrate and will subsequently aggregate on top of each other. Once this is established as a model, the same type of experiment can then be used to generate compound response data, such as the IC50 uh, for GP2B3A inhibitors shown on the left. Here we're testing the effect of shear on dose response. The top plot is at 10 dynes per centimeter squared, and the bottom plot is at 20 dynes per centimeter squared. And what you can see is that the dose response actually shifts as the shear increases. A unique capability of the bioflux system is the ability to perform platelet adhesion and platelet aggregation studies in parallel channels simultaneously. That's very different than using a parallel plate flow chamber where you can really do one at a time. Besides the obvious advantage, which is increasing throughput, this actually gives, for the very first time, the ability to use the same donor for up to 24 conditions at once. This ultimately eliminates unwanted variables when you're doing whole blood assays, which tend to be due to having to draw different donors or draw at different times and also that the blood begins to age in the presence of the anticoagulation treatment. So shown here are time-lapse data from a total of 18 data points over a 10-minute time-lapse. What you can see is that not only can we collect the data during the thrombosis time-lapse, you can see that um, it is increasing up until around five, six minutes, and then it tapers off. But we get very good reproducibility from many of these points. And this really makes for a, real, a great base for a screening experiment. Now let's talk a little bit about cell adhesion, which is actually very similar to platelet adhesion in that, of course, it occurs in the vasculature in response to conditions at the endothelial wall. Here are several stages of cell adhesion that occur in blood vessels. So I, I would call the first one a no adhesion, so there's no interaction with the substrate. Uh, the second one is transient adhesion, which you can actually observe the cells kind of bouncing along the substrate and then moving and then, and then flowing again. Then there's frank rolling, where the cells are truly contacting the substrate, and you can actually observe a reduction in velocity compared to cells that are just flowing with the fluid flow. And finally, this rolling behavior can lead to firm adhesion and actually later transmigration. And what's great about the bioflux is you can actually observe all of these stages within the, the channels, including, of course, time-lapse capture of dynamic data for cell, vo cell rolling velocity, which is often used to characterize receptor ligand interactions in response to inhibitors or other variables like different cell types, mutants, um, other strains, et cetera. And what you can see in this top panel is a stacked micrograph over 30 frames of time-lapse 
where the cells that appear as white trains are actually rolling on the substrate, uh, which in this case is actually VTM. The distance versus time can then be measured to determine the velocity using the Bioflux software. So that's what's shown here on the bottom. The Bioflux can also be used for higher throughput studies of both cell ligand and cell cell adhesion under flow to the point of creating compound response data like IC50 curves. So shown here on the bottom left are two panels taken from a cell adhesion assay under flow where the top channel is a no drug control, and then the channel below it is actually a, a high dose of an anti-VLA4 compound. Data such as these can be used to generate dose response data and IC50 information, which are sh shown on the right for three different anti-VLA compounds. What's very interesting about capturing data using microscopy for cell adhesion is that unlike when you use a plate reader, you collect more data than just the raw fluorescence. In this case, two inhibitors against the same target are used, and if you look at the micrographs, you can actually see that something funny is going on with the panel on the top. Whatever the compound is, is sorry, there's a potentially undesirable outcome of the adhesion inhibitor, uh, which is cellular aggregation. You would never want to see this in your drug that you're, you're targeting. So this is depicted on the right by graphing the cellular area against the shape of the cells. For the normal cells, shown in the bottom panel, both the area and the shape is uniform. And then if you look at the clumped cell, uh, if you look at the data for the clumped cells, what you can see is that the area and the shape are irregular. So this would be a red flag if you were doing a big compound screen to say, this is a compound that I do not want to continue with, and then you could eliminate it from your bank of compounds. Okay, so let's talk about cell migration, switch gears a little bit. Many cell types are screened for motility phenotypes using Boyden chambers or transwell inserts. So that's what's shown here on the top, this little pink cartoon. And what the Boyden chamber consists of, if you're not familiar with it, is that there are two compartments. The top compartment consists of a little uh, dish with a permeable membrane on the bottom, and the bottom compartment is the well of a well plate. And so typically, you would set up an assay with two different environmental conditions here. So either a uh, conditioned media in the bottom or uh, media containing a chemokine, you then place your cells in the top compartment, and if you're studying migration, you would uh, just have the membrane on the bottom. If you were studying something like transmigration or invasion, you would actually have a layer of matrigel in the well, so the cells would actually have to go through that. So Boyden chambers typically provide a static data point in an otherwise dynamic process. This is all assayed at the endpoint of the assay. What we can do in the Bioflux system is using the unique parallel flow capability, we can actually screen the entire process in the channels under uh, time-lapse recording and understand what's happening both from the early time points all the way to the end for migration, invasion, and endothelial cell development. To do this with the Bioflux, let's just look at the 24 well plates again. Um, flow in these plates can be controlled either from one inlet or the other intermittently or parallel wells, meaning two inlets are running at once. Due to the fluid dynamic conditions within the channels, which is always examiner, the two fluids remain compartmentalized in discrete sides of the channel. So that's what you see here on the bottom. This is actually a micrograph of uh, a stream of green fluorescent beads flowing from one inlet and a stream of red fluorescent beads flowing from the other inlet. And what you can see here is that there's no mixing between the, the two streamlines. So when you do this, you continue to have your laminar flow and you have no mixing. So what you have are two compartments within the same channel. In the case of the Bioflux system, we can actually use this parallel flow to make two fluid compartments or we can actually partition the channel into a liquid and solid zone. We have characterized the fluidic compartmentalization of the channels very carefully 
using fluorescent dye modeling as shown here. In this case, we've loaded fluorescent dye into one of the inlets, in this case inlet A, and buffer into inlet B. And then we vary the shear or the pressure on inlet B. So in this graph, what you can see is the resulting highly reproducible conditions over 14 different channels. The size of the compartment is identical from channel to channel, and you can see the size of the dye comp containing compartment in the micrographs above the plot. So that's what's shown here. You can see this little stepwise snapshots of the different compartments that exist with the different shears. And then the plot is actually plotting the size of the compartments over all the channels that we tested. So we can very reliably and reproducibly create these compartments within the channels. So we use this principle to study chemotaxis in vitro. Shown here is a chemotaxis assay where we're flowing FMLP from one inlet and buffer from the other. And FMLP is a very, very strong chemokine. We then collect time-lapse data of the response over approximately an hour's time. And what you can see here is actually uh, the tracks that each cell took inside this green box over time. So all these turquoise and white and purple, those are actually the paths each cell took during the time-lapse. We can also understand dose response to the chemokine, so shown next to it on the top right. In the brighter orange, which is the middle set of bars, those are actually the numbers of cells that are in the chemokine containing compartment at the end of the experiment. And in the, the darker brownish orange ones are the cells that are in the non-chemokine containing compartment for each experiment. We can also follow other parameters like velocity and movement trajectory over time using multidimensional motion analysis, which is part of the Bioflux 1000. So that's what's shown here on the bottom in these black boxes. So in this case, if you look at the very leftmost one, there's buffer flowing in the top and buffer flowing in the bottom. The flow is from the left to right, and the origin of each cell is the white box. And so what you can see is these are the, the x, y coordinates for each cell that we followed, and they're moving basically at random, although somewhat in the direction of the flow. There's nothing to stimulate them to go either way. And then if you look in contrast at the, the plot next to it, this is the same setup, except now we have chemokine in the top flowing, uh, flowing from the top inlet and buffer flowing from the bottom. And so what you can see is from the origin, all of the cells are moving towards the chemokine in the direction of the flow. So we can understand a tremendous amount of information over the time lapse just by plotting out a simple plot like this. And then, of course, you can graph out the dose response with a line graph. For invasion assays, we can use parallel flow to create a gel region inside the channel as if you were using a Voidin chamber turned on its side. The gel can be dosed with compounds or growth factors, and then the cellular response can be followed in time lapse. So this is what's shown here. On the left panel, you have a channel shown in bright field where there's gel patterned in the top of the channel and buffer uh, patterned in the bottom. And then if you look at the panel next to it, uh, I actually included some beads inside the gel. And so in this case, the gel is on the bottom. And you can see on the top, I'm flowing fluorescent beads in the buffer stream. So this can be very useful for setting up a variety of different conditions inside the channels to follow time lapse. The first cell invasion example I'm going to talk about is angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is a multi-step process that starts out relatively simply, typically with a single cell. What happens is the cell gets a chemical message and then responds to that message by starting the process of angiogenesis, which in the worst case scenario can lead to what you can think of um, as quite bad is a highly vascularized tumor. Of course, angiogenesis is important in development and recovery from injury, so it's a very interesting process and um, very, very tightly regulated. The Bioflux has an important advantage for studying the very early steps of angiogenesis, which include 
degradation of the extracellular matrix to leave the blood vessel, invasion into that uh, extra tissue space, and it adds the ability to capture time-lapse data using physiological shear to add, up, add or subtract growth factors. Shear is very important for this step and has actually been studied quite a bit in the literature using collagen plugs and parallel plate flow chambers where many researchers have found that shear actually influences sprouting and branching behavior by endothelial cells. So shown here, in the bioflux system, we use matrigel in one half of the channel and put uh, endothelial cells into the buffer side. Then we continue to flow in starvation media in the buffer stream while the endothelial cells present in the channel reacted to the conditions. And we did this over a period of 48 hours. Within about two hours, endothelial cells actually degraded, invaded into the gel. So what you can see on the left-hand side is an endothelial cell completely inside the gel where it had degraded the matrix and actually begins to behave inside the gel. And the green line shows the, the edge of the gel. And then on the left-hand side, we have different conditions inside the matrix. So their control matrix is shown on the top. And then BFGF, which is a growth factor containing matrix, is shown in the middle panels. And then what we did was we placed an angiogenesis inhibitor inside one of the gel containing compartments. In this case, this is fumagillin, and it's known to inhibit angiogenesis um, and cell proliferation. So what happens in this case is actually all the cells line up along the gel, and they can't enter inside of it and that's uh, the inhibition of angiogenesis. And these images were taken at the end point of the experiment, so about 48 hours into it, and they've undergone apoptosis. What you can see where the little orange arrows are are the sprouting formation of the cells. And this happens dynamically, and you can look at it in time lapse. Another case of cellular invasion is with cancer cells. So metastasis involves movement of cancer cells from the primary tumor to other sites in the body. Again, this is a dynamic multi-step process which can also be investigated using this invasion assay in the bioflux. Shown here are time-lapse data for 15 hours for invasive HD1080 cells, which are on the left, and another non-invasive cancer cell line, MCF7, which are shown on the right. What you can see is that starting around four hours, the HT1080 cells begin to invade the matrix quite vigorously, and the MCF7 cells never move into the matrix. Other similar experiments can be, be performed in the bioflux to characterize the invasiveness of different cell lines, temporal response to inhibitors or unknown compounds. And so, Shown here is the measurement of cell invasiveness over time, where the dark orange line is the actual amount of gel occupied by HT1080 cells over time, and the MCF7 cells are shown in the peach line at the bottom. They never invade the matrix. So finally, let's switch gears and talk about microbiology just for a couple slides. Biofilms are communities of microbes that form on surfaces and a very reliable way to study this biological phenomena is to use flow or irrigated cultures. So using the bioflux, you can study many different types of uh, bacterial and fun fungal strains, many conditions of growth, as well as look at high content information such as 3D and 4D microscopy, and confocal microscopy. Here's just one example of a compound screen using Pseudomonas fluorescence, where the organisms are grown inside the bioflux channels and then subjected to different compounds. In this case, we measured viability of the cultures using two metrics, both viability staining, so live dead staining, and colony forming units in the outlet wells following treatment. This actually paints a picture of the biomass inside the channel as well as the activity of the compound, whether it's bacterial cidal or static or disruptive. The bioflux can also be used to study different strains, different conditions, et cetera. So that just gives you a little taste of the microbiology aspect of it. 
So that concludes our discussion of applications. So here are the two product offerings for Bioflux. On the top is the Bioflux 200 system, which consists of the controller, software, and accessories, everything you need to run your assays if you have your own inverted microscope. And then on the bottom is the Bioflux 1000, and that's a fully automated and integrated system that includes an automated image capture workstation and the hardware and software needed to run walk-away automation as well as automated analysis. Hopefully today you've learned a little bit about the Bioflux, how it provides control over many important aspects of your live cell assays, uh, including both physiological parameters and dynamic data capture, and how you can use the one system to perform many types of assays. If you have further interest in the system or would like more information about the system or the applications, all of that information can be found on our website at fluxionbio.com. Or to inquire about ordering the system or any other inquiries, please contact the, the distributor for your country listed above. Thank you very, very much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions at this point.